Hi. The dual challenge, energy access for all and environmental protection. Sounds easy, but it's not. My wife, Allison, has a food science degree. She knows what food is. <laughs> And therefore, when I sneak that bowl of ice cream at night, it's not without some guilt when I, when I go back to bed. So enter kale. I mean, I love kale. Salads and soups and it's nutrients and, and, and vitamins, but it's not very dense. I'd have to eat a lot of kale to get the energy that I need every day in calories. Enter cow. I, I like cow too, but I'd have to eat a lot of cow. And there's protein. It's pretty good for me. But it, and it's really dense. So is one good and one bad? Is it team herbivore against team carnivore? What about the omnivores? <laughs> Where do they fit in? The reality is probably some sort of a balanced diet is pretty good for us, and I'm always going to sneak in that ice cream, okay? <laughs> we can have local solutions for cow. We can have local solutions for kale. This is Farmer John, who I spent time with in Africa. Solar panel, lifting water from an aquifer. And he now grows vegetables in his garden and sells them in local markets. But we're dense. There's a lot of people in the world. It takes dense solutions. Dense cattle, dense kale. In fact, the impacts of farming for feeding our food and eating ourselves are real. Fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides, and you think about soil depletion in the water there, the air quality, and the emissions are large from farming. Food impacts the environment a lot, okay? So I had this brilliant idea, we should, we should probably just end food, you know, <laughs> clean up the environment. Um, well, I smile when I say we're not going to end food, but we do need to work to continue to clean up the environment related to food the energy and the environment challenge. And it's not simple, but food's not the only thing we get energy from. In fact, our homes and our phones, our, our pets and our jets, <laughs> our, our heaters and our beaters, uh, water and daughters and sons and everything they wear, our packs and our snacks, you know, our games and our frames, the paste and the waste. Uh, we have lights and sight. We have our, our noses and our, our clothes and our wheels and our meals, everything in our lives, everything in our lives depends on energy, everything. So when you come back to the basics, the light, the food, the water, and the homes that we take for granted, many in the world can't, about half the people. This little girl I met in Ecuador, she told me her dreams on the bed where she sleeps with her parents, dirt floors, open air. And she tied a friendship bracelet on me that I never took off till it literally fell off. In Ethiopia, I met a grandfather who has grandkids, and he had tears in his eyes when he told me they will have something he's never had, school. And they're all starting in the second grade because they've never been in school before. In Vietnam, I met with Thon, who lives in severe poverty. Those three frying pans are her wind turbine, a little bit of electricity. She carries her crippled son across that plank every morning on her back so he can go to a school. In Kenya, light bulbs dangle from a church that doubles as a school. And these kids walk across mounds of garbage and polluted water and soil every day in their uniforms. I've been in 60 countries. I've seen the most severe wealth and the most severe poverty. And everywhere, the worst environments in the world are where it's poor. They can't afford to clean it up. In Nepal, Sanakanchi is cooking over wood indoors. And like three billion other people who cook with dung and wood, we visited the Seni Memorial Hospital where kids die every week from lung diseases and moms from cancer, and they get cataracts. Three billion people, it kills three million people every year. That's as many as COVID-19 killed in 2020, every single year. So when we brought her an electric cooktop, she had a huge smile and she said, I can't read, but my daughter can. And she'll help me understand how to use this. And down in Columbia, these kids, about half of them will die before they reach adulthood of things that wouldn't kill us. Dysentery, tooth infections. They're coming in from the hills and the agrarian villages to try to get into schools. We brought first solar there. You can see the panels on the left, the Arwako village of Gunchukwa. 
And that last night when we turned on those lights, I was with the mamo, the chief. They'd never seen each other at night except over fire. It was one of the most remarkable moments of my life. This shows global income, the wealth in the world. The yellows are severe poverty. And they're emerging, they're trying to emerge. And, and as they do that, Sana Kanchi and people, the three billion who cook like her, and the kids that are trying to get into schools around the world, and you see grandfathers and, and kids coming out of the bush, literally out of the bush, carrying their kids on their backs and getting first electricity. It's about half the people in the world that are trying to emerge now into economic situations like we have. They need affordable energy. They need to be able to afford something. The developing world has energy, but it's not reliable to them. It comes and goes, and that's a big part of Latin America and Eastern Europe and parts of Russia and other places in the world. Four out of every five people live in emerging and developing economies today. Four out of every five. Now, the rich world, us, the blue, it's not that extensive, is it? We want it clean. And in fact, if you look at air quality in the world, for example, the green is where it's the cleanest. Where's that? Where it's rich. The worst air quality is where? Where it's poor. They can't afford to clean it up. Transitions are happening all over the world, different paces and different circumstances. Severe economic poverty increases to the right, and severe energy poverty increases up. Latin America is doing pretty well. They're coming out of the severe of both. Much greater population in Asia, more severe energy and economic poverty. And Africa, another 1.1 billion people, severe in both. You see this relationship of getting access to energy and coming out of economic poverty, but it presents a dilemma, a paradox. Energy won't end poverty, but you can't end poverty without energy. Data must be used to tell the truth, not to call to action, okay. no matter how noble the intentions. Hans Rosling said that in his wonderful book, Factfulness, no matter how noble the intentions. I testified to the US Senate in their first climate hearing about a year ago, and we talked about the difference between completely factual and factually complete. Factually complete is seeking the truth, which is very hard to do. Yes, there's low density food and there's low density energy. Solar wind and biomass and batteries are very low density. High density energy or coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear. It's not judgmental, it's physics. <laughs> it's hundreds of times denser, okay? Renewable, fossil, and nuclear. Just as a balanced diet, you know, comes from a good mix, so does energy. We see a diverse energy mix provides energy security all working together, and every leader on the planet is looking for security for their people. Now let's look at global energy consumption by energy type. First, coal and oil. They're still growing globally. They're very dense, but they make a lot of CO2. Natural gas and nuclear are growing globally. They're very dense. They make less CO2. Renewables are growing globally. Hydro leads and solar and wind are coming on, and they don't make much CO2. Okay, very little. You'll hear, you've probably learned, solar and wind are growing faster than any other resource. It's completely factual. Look at the growth rates of solar and wind in the world. What would make it factually complete? Scaling it. Let's scale them the same. There is solar and wind. It's right in the data. Kind of discouraging, but it doesn't even keep up with the growth and demand for energy globally. And it's growing very quickly. That's one of the realities of energy. So we code these, coal and oil and green, gas and nuclear and renewables. And gas and nuclear, dense, clean, er, work hand in hand. Yet coal and oil are still 60% of the world's energy. Why is that? They're affordable and reliable. If you look by region, you see North America and Europe, we've been flat in our energy demand for almost three or four decades. Asia is growing tremendously. The rest of the world the emerging poor world is just getting started. Now, population and economic development drive energy demand. They always have. And that's why this is happening. The emissions from that should be no surprise then. North America and Europe were actually coming down. Asia is growing tremendously. And the rest of the world is just getting started in their emissions. Largely driven by coal. 
We built on it, the UK, Germany, so is China and many parts of Asia today. It's affordable and reliable to them, but there's another reason. Let's build this graph together. The OECD is the club of rich nations. We're in it. And the non-OECD. Above that red line, countries consume more than they produce. Below the red line, they produce more than they consume. So let's start with us, the US. We consume more than we produce, and we make about 5 billion tons of CO2 from humans, anthropogenic, every year. China makes 10 billion tons of CO2, but they produce more stuff than they consume. In fact, most of the non-OECD produces, their producers, most of the rich countries we consume. We say what? Send us our stuff. <laughs> Check what you're wearing today. Where does it come from? And what do we effectively say back? Emit our CO2. We'll be green, and you make it cheap and emit for us. Is that a zero emission strategy? It seems to be these days. How many atmospheres are there in the world? There's one, just one, and it's really efficient, more than the ocean, it's circulating greenhouse gases. This isn't a solution for climate change. It's the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Aristotle said that, not me. I think he was talking about critical thinking, civil dialogue, entertaining thoughts without having to accept them. Climate change is really important in the world. But it's not the only thing. The land, the air, and the water are pillars of our environment. These work together. They are very interconnected. We can't go too far in one without potentially harming the other. So we come back to clean and dirty, what you've probably learned, or might have learned. And the dirty is dirty, okay? You manufacture the stuff, you mine and drill for it, you, you handle the water and move it around, and eventually we burn it. We featured this in our first film, Switch, the pros and the cons, a massive coal mine. Fracking, hydraulic fracturing to lift oil and gas from the earth. What do you do with a nuclear waste? A big coal power plant outside of Houston, very dense, makes electricity for half of the city. Big impacts, big Im positive ones too. How about the clean stuff? It turns out it has the exact same things. We have to mine and manufacture the metals to build the panels and turbines and batteries. We have to produce it using a lot of land, transmit it, and eventually where does it go? Here's a giant mine I visited in Montana. Let's zoom in to get a feel for scale. That's a drilling rig and a front end loader across it. It produces metals, copper, that goes into wind turbines. Here's a lithium mine. There are a lot of those in the world, and there are going to be a lot more to do what? Power our electric vehicles. This is the floor bed of a sedan. There are 7,000 batteries in that one car each bigger than your cell phone a little bit. Let's do some arithmetic, 7,000. 1.4 billion vehicles in the world to, we have 8 billion people almost. If we electrify half of those, it's gonna be 4.9 trillion new batteries. To make 4.9 trillion, just for half, would take 37 years if we could make 250,000 batteries a minute, 24-7, 365. And where do they go? When they wear out, you know they do. You have cell phones. Where do they go? Where do the panels go? I visited this a decade ago in southern Spain. Where do those panels go, which are also toxic? Same place as the wind turbine blades. This is 100 wind turbine blades being buried. They're cut into thirds by a giant earth mover. They're inert, but they'll be there forever. We have 40,000 wind turbine blades in Texas now and they are wearing out. We will bury them. It's a conundrum. The sun and the wind are renewable, but the panels, turbines, and batteries are not. You're not gonna like me. There's no renewable energy. It all takes earth resources, we make it, and we put it back in the earth. We've gotta do it really well. The reality is, large-scale energy systems have large-scale environmental impacts. Humans do. So come back to our map, the wealth in the world. Watch the yellows and reds as I fade this into a satellite view at night of the Earth. You can see where the lights are on and where they're off. They're off where it's poor. They don't have much energy. 
Here's our color codes, the distribution of energy around the world, coal and oil, nuclear, natural gas, and yellow. Let's scale them first. This is how much is actually consumed. So you can see where, where the lights are on now, and you know why. They have energy. And we could get rid of the coal and oil, the high CO2. Asia and Africa are going to have to work hard to do that. Europe and the U.S. were about halfway there. Nuclear, natural gas, and renewables, about halfway there. And others, too, different mixes. But some still say, no, we've got to get rid of natural gas and nuclear as well. What is left? And how quickly is it growing? Can we do that? Should we do that? That's 10% of the world's energy left. What happens if we darken the world's lights by 90%? Does that look like the future to you? It looks like the past to me. We've got to turn the world's lights on. Everything in the world depends on energy. What happens if you gave up 90% of what you have? If we turn the lights on and bring energy for a billion people, hunger, clothing, shelter, clean water, another education and health care and the refrigerations and vaccines that go with that, the rights and empowerment of women, they go for the water. They're cooking indoors. They don't get to go to the schools when their male counterparts do often. Population is directly tied to education and energy. Immigration and migration away from autocrats. It's happening in the world today right there. The largest migration since the end of World War II. The ability to invest in the environment from a healthy economy and to mitigate and adapt to climate change. If I bring all that together, we have the tools to begin to address the dual challenge. Now, it's not easy. No one owns the truth. We just seek it. Shaming is destructive. Civil dialogue is vital in these conversations. Energy and environment, they have to be addressed together or both will fail. It's not simple, the dual challenge, but it's solvable. And I know you will solve it if we act as one team. Let's get on the same page and together we can better the world. Thanks.